Oh, yeah. Great job, you guys. Great job. Great job, man. Nothing like a kid singing a song that was written 30 years before he was born, right? <laughs> awesome, man. I love it. I love that phrase. You know, I love to act surprised, but they did this the last two services. So, uh, oh, my mom and dad this time, though. That's really nice. So it is Pastor hey, mom, Rick's 53rd birthday. Hey, dad, I you? mean, 23, sorry. Love you. Would you all sing with us? So, sing happy can, birthday to our pastor. I like that. <laughs> happy birthday to you. My mom loves the stage. <laughs> I like that shirt. It's good. <laughs> You're a dog too. Love you. Love you. Very sweet. Wow. That was a labor of love for my mom to come out on this stage, let me tell you. So it means a lot for both of them. We, uh, I leaned over and said, if I'm 53, how old are you? That's the scary reality. But uh, thank you guys. I'm not normally here on my birthday, but I'm glad to be here. We're getting ready. We're actually leaving Right after the next service, going to do some camping with the family. Got all the kids and grandkids. They're all loaded up and ready to go. And I was thinking about this message. I really was. That song, I love that song. And, and you can just hear, you know, the, the great apostles, Paul, George, John, and Ringo, uh, searching spiritually for, their, uh, for, for what was important in their life. And, you know, John was on this kind of Buddhist track of trying to figure life out, and, and George was a Hindu, and then Hare Krishna, and then uh, Ringo was a drummer, so he didn't care about any of it. And then, uh, and then Paul had this kind of Christ-centered Catholic upbringing, and, and all of them were just confused. And you know, the, the message that is preached in, in that song really is a message of Jesus. We got to come together. The truth is, though, you can't come together if Jesus doesn't rule and reign in your life. I mean, the, the, Jesus said, listen, I'm coming to the world to bring hope, to bring life, to bring joy, to bring peace. I also come with a sword. And what he meant by that is his truth is easy to understand, but it also divides. We've seen it divide families. That wasn't his purpose. That was a reality. And so our hope is that when people understand Jesus, understand his message of salvation, understand that it's a free gift, then you can truly know perfect peace and really what unity is all about. And let me just say this, nobody, <clears throat> nobody should understand what it means to be unified like the church. No one. No organization, no organism. And sadly, we don't set a very good example. And I'm not talking about Grace Church, I'm talking about the North American church. You know, <clears throat> you go to the Christian church around the world, there's approximately 2.5 billion Christians around the world you go anywhere where they're being persecuted, they are united. <clears throat> Come to America where life is easy, you say your life is easy, you know what I'm talking about. Generally speaking, compared to the rest of the world, we have an uneasy street. And the church is suffering. Where it's growing around the world and 15,000 Muslims are coming to Christ every single day. Did you know that? In America, <clears throat> 8,000 churches closed last year. The average church in America today, Christian Evangelical Church, is 98 members. That's down from 186 just five years ago. You know, as a pastor of 34, almost 35 years, a guy that spent his entire life literally in ministry, that breaks my heart. You know, we're not in competition with other churches. We're in competition with the gates of hell. <clears throat> and, and so we've got to come together. So for the next month, you know, it's always been my my job, I was kind of commissioned myself in 1989 when we started the church. Each summer, I would preach through a, a book. And sometimes it'd be as small as Ruth, and then sometimes it'd be as long as Proverbs. And uh, I've thought about that. You know, 30 years, we're not even halfway through the Bible. But I like to go through a book in the summer. It kind of keeps us focused. The next 12 weeks, we're going to be studying the book of Corinthians and really learning what it means. I talked to a young lady uh, that was visiting for the first time. She was a guest and by the way, hello to everybody watching online. I had a chance to see you all on Facebook Live and, and live stream. But um, <clears throat> she said this to me. She said, uh, I haven't been to church for a couple of years. I was in a church for 10 years. I, I don't want to complain, but I got hurt. I've been burned out. She said, today just revitalized my joy. It gave me hope again. And she said, you know what I love the most? 
She said, I understood everything you said, and I know how to put this into practice. I go, that is the greatest compliment you could pay me. And, and in this ministry, over the course of the next 12 weeks, we're going to learn from the book of Corinthians how to get it together, both personally and as a ministry. And today I want to talk to you about chapter 1, which is really that question, why can't we just get along? You know, why is it, and I'm not talking about the rest of the world. Obviously, if people don't know Jesus, they don't know peace. But as Christians, why are we fighting? Why are we arguing? Why are we bickering? Why do we have personal differences? And, and how do we overcome that? <clears throat> My son-in-law made the funniest statement uh, the other day. You know, he didn't grow up camping. And so Chad and my daughter, Brittany, they have three kids. And so we're taking a little, little rain is going with this. You know, she's five months old. And uh, Jordan and Kim have the other two kids. And then uh, Brooklyn. And, and, and uh, of course, my son Jared is getting shook in California. And, uh, <clears throat> and so we're getting ready to go. And Chad didn't grow up camping. Camping for him was like going to a hotel, right? So this whole getting prepared for the week to go camping is new to him. And so we're getting all the tents, campers, you know, all that stuff ready. And he doesn't know that I can hear him and Brittany in their pop-up. Uh, he's not quite used to that yet. And he goes, man, it's exhausting getting ready to go relax. I go, that's a quote of the year right there. It is exhausting. And, and you know what? I used to be the guy that was like, no. You know, my wife has a spreadsheet for camping. You are messed up, Right? No, she's amazing, but she's just that organized person. And in the early years of our marriage, uh, next month will be 34 years, in the early years of our marriage, that drove me crazy. I'm like, no, just throw this stuff in there. We'll sort it out when we get to the lake or the mountains. She's like, no, we won't. Well, she changed me. She converted me. Now I plan and prep and everything's marked and labeled and put in the right place. But you know what happens when you get it all together before you go camping? The moment you get to the site, you don't have to do what I did for 15 years. Get to the site and work on your campsite for two days while everybody else is having fun. Now we get there, everything just almost falls into place, and we're out having fun. We're having a good time. And you know what? When we get it together in life, life is enjoyable. And some of you are thinking, man, I need to get it together in my marriage. This series for you. I need to get it together in my job. This series is for you. I need to get it together in my business. This series is for you. I need to get it together in my worship. It's for you. This book is so practical. And what is so amazing about Corinthians is it is really considered the Apologia Pro Vita Sua, which literally means uh, Paul's defense of who he was as an apostle. And, and it is the most autobiographical book in the New Testament of the 12 books that he wrote. And it was written around 56, 57 AD, which, by the way, is very important. You may say, oh, I don't like history. I don't care about that. That's very important for you to understand that Paul is defending the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ with people who were alive when it happened, with people who were walking the earth and could have debunked this lie of resurrection if it wasn't true. And so Paul brings that defense, and he brings it to a church, let's just be real, that's jacked up. They got every problem you can possibly imagine. Sound familiar? Grace Church. Yeah, you know what I love about our ministry is we see people come to Jesus every week in almost every service. Last week in the middle of summer, we baptized 37 new believers. We have baptized over 400 people in the last four years. Guys, that's an amazing miracle considering the average church in America sees one convert every three years. Now, we're blessed to see it, but you know what that means? It means that you're faithful to bring people. It means that we're faithful to be a church that welcomes people. And it shows that we're on the front line of sharing the gospel in a culture that is getting more and more anti-God and anti-Christian every day. And if you don't think so, you're not paying attention. Now, I say that to say this. Corinth, 2,000 years ago, try and envision it. You know, think of like Tokyo or New York City. It was a mecca of trade. You know, it was right there near Athens, I mean in Greece, and it, it, was, it was right there where all the lucrative financial deals were, were being made. Uh, there was uh, many ports, and at that time, the main gathering place of Corinth was less than a mile away from the temple of Aphrodite. Why is that important? Because the temple of Aphrodite, 
uh, the Greek goddess of sexuality, fertility, and love had a thousand temple prostitutes. These women would shave their heads, put on the masks of false gods, and have sexual relations in one of the 33 wineries or wine houses in the city. And so, you know, it's not a surprise that alcohol and sexuality all go together in this setting, you know. Uh, These female prostitutes were coming to Christ just like everybody else. And so Paul gets really practical. We even talk about this, I don't know, week eight or nine, I can't remember the message that I wrote on this, but we'll talk about 1 Corinthians 11 that says it's a shame for a, a woman to have Um, or a man to have long hair and for a woman to have short hair. It's not a sin. He's not saying that all men have to have their hair above their ears and all women have to have long hair. He's saying in this culture, these women were shaving their heads. And so these guys were coming into the churches uh, and they're sitting like three rows back from a woman with a bald head going, I wonder if that's the one I was with last week. And so they couldn't even worship, couldn't even focus. I love how practical the Word of God is. Man, this church had every problem from Christians suing Christians to a man who was having sexual relations either with his biological mom or his stepmom. They were getting drunk and there was gluttony at the communion table. Uh, They were abusing uh, just about every grace uh, gift that they were given in the church. They were not generous. They weren't giving faithfully and financially. Uh, he talks about everything. And of all those things that, that are sins and struggles, and by the way, that's how the church is supposed to look. If you're reaching the lost people, it's messy. Because don't forget, you and I were lost at one time too. Don't forget that we are depraved just as well. And, and sometimes I see Christians get this attitude. Well, you know, those people. I can't believe those people think that way. Guys, it is important to recognize that those people used to be you and me, and they need Jesus. So Paul comes in, and of all the struggles in the church, do you know the major hang-up he starts with in chapter 1? It's not promiscuity, it's not homosexuality, it's not, you know, uh, valuing life, it's not these crude sins I just talked about, it's causing divisions in the church. That's where he starts. It's about having personal conflict and resolving it. It's about having corporate conflict. Now, where does personal conflict come from? I think this may be one of the most eye-opening realities, and though it may be simple to understand, it's something you have to remind yourself of every day. That as a Christian, we are in the world, but not of the world. That we're supposed to be a light in the darkness, which means around us is darkness. It means that we sit in a position of forgiveness and grace and mercy, but we do not sit in a position of judgment of anyone. And so he walks this fine line. Now remember, our motto for this year is healthy heart, healthy home. That was our our annual motto for this year. We want you to get healthy this year. We decided, and as your pastor decided, we're not going to take on all kinds of new projects. We're not going to go to different places in the world right now. We're not going to add all kinds of other struggles and vision. We're just going to get healthy. Now the danger with getting healthy six months in is we can get selfish. Forget what the church is here for. But our goal is, if you're a healthy believer, you'll have a healthy family. And if you have a healthy family, there'll be a healthy church. And if there's a healthy church, there'll be a healthy city. And if there's a healthy city, there'll be a healthy nation. And if there's a healthy nation, there'll be a healthy world. That's how it works. So Paul comes in and he says, listen, there is personal conflict. And there was a lot of personal conflict in the church. They were arguing over the silliest of things we'll look at in just a moment. But I want you to jot these down because anytime you're having personal conflict, I guarantee you, you can go back to these four character traits and find at least one of them is why you're having conflict with people in your life. The first is this, we don't all believe in Jesus. We don't all believe in Jesus. Now you write that down, I'm going to eat my cupcake. No, I'm just kidding. So here's the deal. That's my problem with food. It's like screaming my name right now. You can't hear it, but it's like, eat me, eat me. Anyway, so here's the deal. We don't all believe in Jesus. So we live in a world where, as Christians, our eyes have been opened. Next week, one of the most important messages 
something I've been working on. Pastor Jim's been working on. He's going to share something that is extraordinary and one of the most important passages in 1 Corinthians because it deals with how a person who is a non-believer cannot understand the things of God. They are foolishness to him. Now, we don't all believe in Jesus. Believing in Jesus was so paramount and so important to the message Paul was writing. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 through 2, and I'll show you something. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and from our brother Sosthenes. I am writing to God's church in Corinth, to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy, which means to be set apart, by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Jesus is mentioned ten times in the first ten verses. You know, at first glance, you might not notice this, but what Paul is saying is everything, absolutely everything in the church is supposed to be built on the foundation of the gospel of Jesus. That we can't have healthy relationships. If I'm a believer in Jesus, you're not a believer in Jesus. I have to extend grace. I have to be humble. I need to encourage you. I need to love you. But we are not going to see eye to eye. One of the most frustrating comments I hear Christians make, and it usually is as it relates to politics, drives me insane, is this comment. I can't believe they believe this is okay. I can't believe they think that's okay. Guys, sinners are supposed to sin. People who don't know Jesus are not supposed to see the, the abortion the same way we do. Or, or, or maybe the traditional family the way we may. Or, or, or how to handle our finances. Or what it means to be generous to the ministry. They don't see it that way. As a matter of fact, to them, we're insane. Right? And so we have to understand, we don't all believe in Jesus. And let me just make one more comment about that. I'm not talking about believing that Jesus existed I'm not talking about saying, oh yeah, historically, I, I believe he was a real person. That's an intellectual assent that Jesus existed. I'm talking about saving faith, which says, Jesus is God in the flesh who died for me and rose again, and I've put my trust in him. We don't all believe that way. And it is getting increasingly less and less in this country. And it's not going to get better unless we as a church take serious our mission. Second, we don't all talk like Jesus. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, the, the things Jesus said that were obviously setting him apart as God. I mean, if, if you walk into a room and say, what is easier for me to perform, uh, the raising of the dead or the forgiving of sins, you're going to look like a nut job, all right? Uh, we, we have to be careful not to uh, fall into that trap. I'm talking about just using the language of love, using the language of right and wrong. Look at this. Paul says, this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and from our brother Sosthenes, I am writing to God's church in Corinth. And by the way, the Holy Spirit is writing to all churches and all believers for all time. To you have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus. There it is again. Now, we don't all talk like Jesus. Verse 5 says, uh, we don't talk like Jesus because they were using eloquent, churchy words. You ever caught yourself talking to a non-believer and saying things like, well, God just moved in my heart, just revealed some things to me. They're like, oh, straight jacket time. You need me to drive you to the funny farm or can you get there on your own, right? I mean, do you know the weirdest thing for non-believers? And maybe you're a non-believer, you came in today, thanks for coming. Maybe you're watching online, you're checking out this whole Christianity thing. You know the weirdest thing for them? When we sing to God, they're like, ooh. They're just sort of standing there going, why is she raising her hand? Why is he mumbling, mumbler, mumbling, what's going on? I'm just being real, okay? It's the weirdest thing in the world to a non-believer. They don't even get it. As a matter of fact, I know Christians who still haven't understood the importance of musical worship, and they're still kind of freaked out by it. We don't all talk like Jesus. You know what else? We don't all think like Jesus. 
Now, truth is, I don't know many days that I've spent most of my time thinking like Jesus. Five minutes before I came out here, no, scratch that. 30 seconds before I came out here, my wife calls me. We're getting ready to leave camping the moment I drive out of here. We bought something for our camper that, you know, was going to help us get reception for, you know, work and Wi-Fi and whatnot. And I, I bought it and brought it home. She's been working on it. She sends back, honey, it's broken. It was brand new. I'm like, oh, can anything work? Praise Jesus, you know. <laughs> Had to come out here. You know, we don't all think like Jesus, Okay. Just be honest. And he uses that word, and all of your knowledge. Now, let me explain something. The Corinthians had already become arrogant. They were new believers, but they thought they were super intelligent because Apollos had been there with them, and Paul had been there with them, and you know they, they just became really heady Christians. Here's what this means for us. Here's a little uh, uh, detour for a moment. We don't need Christians in America who know more about the Bible. We need Christians in America who do more of the Bible. You already know 90% more of the Bible than you're living. And if you go into a church, you go into a college class, you go into seminary and you fill your mind with more information. That's great. It's great to get knowledge. I know I've spent my life being an educated person or trying to be, all right? And, and that's all great. That knowledge, here's what it does. It makes you more responsible. Now I know the right I should do, I better do it. Because I'm held accountable for it. And see, not all people think like Jesus. So 1 Corinthians 8, we'll look at this when we get down the line, says that knowledge makes you arrogant, but love builds you up. So it's the app applied knowledge that makes us mature Christians. I, I literally saw a picture of this yesterday, running around, picking up stuff for camping. My oldest son lost a little panel for his uh, trailer. He, he's like, Dad, can you swing by and pick it up? So I go in that Gander camping place, used to be Kettleson's over off Kipling. And as I walk in the door, I knew the moment I walked through the door, I didn't even have to hear a word. I knew the guy behind the counter was talking to my son, Jordan. Because Jordan be your friend in like 30 seconds. And the guy's laughing. Oh, yeah, people are waiting in line. He's like, oh, that's great. Yeah, no, man, sorry, I don't have it. And, I, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, you're talking to my son, right? He's like, who are you? I go, is that Jordan? He goes, yeah. So I was just kind of laughing. So I walk over, and I'm in the aisle. And there's this guy. I would tell you I guessed he was 63, but he said he was 63. He was with a young girl that works there. And uh, he was asking her, she was, you know, he wanted to put lights on his trailer. And she said, well, it's just a simple little solder job. He goes, you solder? She goes, yeah, I try, you know, I try and solder, try and weld a little bit. He goes, oh. And he literally did this. He goes, hmm, you're a learner, aren't you? And she said, yeah. He goes, well, I'm a professor of 40 years. He goes, I'm a teacher. And I wanted so bad to stop and say, you're not a very good one. No, you know Why? Because great leaders are great learners, and you never stop learning. You never arrive, professors, teachers, pastors, parents. The day you stop learning is the day you stop leading. And so we don't all think like Jesus. We don't all serve like Jesus. You know, Jesus, God in the flesh, came into the world and served. You know, we often say Jesus died for the sins of the world. Yes, that's where our salvation was purchased, was at the cross. But let's not forget, Jesus spent his 33 and a half years serving us. He washed our feet both practically and, and for, for many of us, uh, it was the image of service that was demonstrated in that. Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost. What makes us think as a church we should have a different mission? Our mission in this ministry is very simple. We're here to seek and save the lost. And we want heaven to be a much more crowded place. And we want to put a dent in hell. 1 Corinthians 1, 7, you talk about service. He says, now you have every spiritual gift. Will you just circle that? 
you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what he's saying. Hey, Corinthians, you have every spiritual gift necessary to serve my purposes, so start, or serve God's purposes, so start serving. I want to give you an example of those four principles being lived out in my life. I know you've kind of heard this a lot lately because Pastor Barry and the Celebrate Recovery team are doing such an amazing job. I mean, the day before the 4th of July, they had over 100 people here for Celebrate Recovery. Lives are being transformed. If you are hung up uh, on a hurt, a habit, or or something that's got control of your life and you want victory and and you really want to be delivered uh, through God's plan, go to Celebrate Recovery on Wednesday nights at 6 And you will, I guarantee you, you'll be transformed because that is not just a program, it's a biblical approach to overcoming. But that being said, Pastor Barry and I have been friends for 42 years. And we grew up in a neighborhood with eight guys, all of us within three years of each other. Okay, there were other kids, other guys in the neighborhood, four or five years younger, but, but we were close. And when we moved in that neighborhood, I really never knew how brilliant my parents were. I don't even think they know how brilliant they were with something that happened in their life. They came to know Jesus as their Savior. Then I got saved a little while after that. And, and my parents, you know, they weren't these long-time Christians who had all the little, you know, catchphrases and wore the nice clothes to the nice church. They were just real, genuine people. And we lived in a house with 13 to 14 foster girls between the ages of 12 and 17. And so my parents knew what it was like to love the world, to be in the world but not of the world, and to treat every single young lady like a creation of God. Well, they taught us that. We moved in this neighborhood, and and literally my parents had one rule for my brother and I. I I can't remember my parents ever sitting down saying, don't do this and don't go here. They said, honor God. That's it, honor God. Because they knew if I honored God, I wouldn't get into all those things they'd have to tell me no about. And and you know what? For the most part, I really didn't. I did other stuff, but I didn't get into drugs and sleeping around, all that kind of stuff. I I just, I didn't. And, And so we come into this neighborhood and here's all these guys, they all had something in common. None of them were Christians. And so my brother and I learned from our parents that as a Christian, you're supposed to be the light in the darkness. And that means you just love people. You just hang out with people. Relational evangelism is what they taught us. And over the course of time, not because of us and not because of my family, we saw every single one of them come to know Jesus as their Savior. Now, I talk about that. I still had plenty of hang-ups. And one of my hang-ups was... I would love you and do anything for you and serve you. And, and if, you, if I was loyal to you, you didn't have to worry. I also had a terrible temper. And when it came to uh, competition, this can be really hard for you to believe, but I, I like would die before I'd lose. That was just my mentality, okay? And so we grew up in this neighborhood, and there was this kid in the neighborhood. He was eight months younger than me, and he was the most annoying person on earth to me. You know, there's no such thing as personality conflict. There's sin. And I had sin in my heart because he bugged me. And he was one of these people that love to needle you over everything. You know those people? They make fun of you. They say things. And, man, I would hold back for a lot of years from really pummeling him. And the, the reason was I'd been in a fight with all my other friends, and they could hold their ground. I didn't think he could. And then one day... We're in a basketball game, Barry, all of us were there, and he just pushed me. And instead of handling things properly, I punched him. And, and it ended up that it burst some blood vessels in his, he ended up in the hospital. And his stepdad was this you know, bodybuilder Italian guy that had a horrible temper. And man, he came down to my house, and my dad opened the door, and he looked at me and said, don't you ever hit Steve Again, you got a problem, you bring him to me. And if you don't bring him to me, I'll do something about it. And I'm just standing there, yes, sir. And I was waiting for my dad to go, okay, Ken. My dad's like, yeah. (laughs) Okay. So anyways, uh, you know, that that was a learning experience for me when it came to solving conflict the wrong way. And what I had to remind myself of is that not everybody's a believer in Jesus. Not everybody thinks like Jesus, talks like Jesus, and serves like Jesus, me included. 
So you know what that does? That creates grace in your life. So when you're having personal conflict, don't blame it on personality. Blame it on sin and do something about it. Now, that's personal conflict. But what causes conflict in the church? Paul says two things cause conflict in the church. We're going to bring this home now. First of all, the biggest thing that causes conflict in the church today and 2,000 years ago is we think the church exists to give us what we want. The church is here for moi. That's what the church is here for. And man, let me tell you, this disease is epidemic in America. And this disease is killing the church today. It is not an exaggeration to say that we've baptized over 8,000 people in 30 years. It's not an exaggeration to say that over 35,000 people have indicated faith alone in Christ alone in our adult services in 30 years. But you know what else is not an exaggeration? Where are most of them? Most of them got caught up in a mentality of spectator, not participant worship. They got caught up in the consumerism mentality of going to church rather than dying to self. You know, I, I could go on and on about this, but I think it's very important to see what Paul says. Look at this. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be, circle it, no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, this is very important, underline that, united in and circle thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Here's what happens. We come to know Jesus as our personal Savior. We believe he died on the cross for our sins. We receive it by grace. We're humbled. We're grateful. But over time, the newness of that salvation wears off. And we start to go, oh, you know this place that I really thought was perfect church, which by the way, we're not. They're not really perfect. Oh, you know that preacher that I thought was, you know, the best preacher? He's actually got some rough edges. And you know what? I don't like the volume of the music. Oh, you know what? I don't like the length of the sermons. Oh, you know what? I don't like the chairs. And I don't like how long I have to stand in line to check my kids in. And I don't like the fact that they close check-in down 20 minutes after service starts. And I, should I go on, guys? I'm loaded with these. I got hundreds of them, all right? I, they're all in a file downstairs and on my computer. Literally, thousands of people have come to Christ and tens of thousands have walked away from the church for this very reason. And the church is anemic now in America. Man, if we had to really come together for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of this nation, we would not be able to. Philippians 2.5 says, In your lives you must, here it is, think and act like Christ Jesus. Do you know what Jesus' only focus was? His Father's purposes. That was it. Jesus came to earth to fulfill the purposes of God. We are here to fulfill the purposes of God. Hear me. I'm preaching to the choir right now. And I know that some of you watching online, you know, you're just out of town or just watching because you're sick or, you know, you're not able to be here. I'm preaching to the choir because most likely, most of you love what God's doing in this ministry. You understand our humanity and our deficiencies, and you're just thrilled to be a part of a move of God. But I am here to tell you as a pastor, there is nothing that has ripped me up inside and devastated me and caused me to want to quit ministry a million different ways more than this. You pour your life, your resources, your staff, your time into people and they get mad over the stupidest of things. This church is not here for my purposes or yours. It's here for God's. And you know what else causes conflict? Paul says we worship spiritual leaders more than the God they serve. Man, this was epidemic in Corinth 2,000 years ago. It's worse today. Because today, 
we can podcast our favorite preachers and singers and we can watch YouTube and we can, I mean, heck, we don't even have to go to church because we can just listen every day of the week. We're missing the entire purpose of ministry, though. Now, look what happened here. Some of you are saying, I'm a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos or I follow Peter or I follow only Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. For now, no one can say they were baptized in my name. For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news, and not with clever speech, for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. In other words, keep it simple. <clears throat> Last week, we baptized 37 people. In the middle of summer, that's an incredible celebration. But I was asked the question I'm asked every time we baptize somebody. Pastor Rick, can you baptize me? And I say, no, I, I won't be able to, but I'll be there to celebrate. On a rare occasion, I may get in the tub, but there is a main reason I don't. Because as your lead pastor, as a person who speaks most of the time on behalf of the ministry, the last thing I want people to do is go, oh, well, you know, I was baptized by Pastor Rick. Because by the way, there ain't nothing special about it. Baptism is about being baptized in the name of Jesus. And this ministry, it is not a personality-driven ministry. It's a purpose-driven ministry. We're here for God's purposes. And I, God forbid something would happen to me, to my family, to any of us on, in leadership. This church must go on for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of God's purposes. That's what we're about. And so <clears throat> my commitment and our commitment is that we remain a ministry built on the name of Jesus. We're not here to worship an individual. That doesn't mean we don't encourage each other. That doesn't mean we can't appreciate each other. That doesn't mean that we, we shouldn't revere and respect our leaders because we should. It just means don't worship anyone but God. So how do we get along? Let me send you home with these three principles Paul gives. How do we get along? How do we get along in ministry? How do we get along personally? First, give the gospel the greatest priority in your church and lives. In other words, the moment every person in this ministry owns the vision of sharing the gospel with everyone in our world, you will fall in love with this ministry. We will promise you, and we have never faltered on this promise in 30 years. It doesn't matter who stands up here, whether it's R.J. Kerper as a guest speaker, Randy, Pastor Jim, Pastor Barry, it doesn't matter. They're going to give the gospel or they're not going to speak. There's going to be a presentation of the gospel at the end of every message. Every time the doors are open, every time we sponsor a function, every time we sponsor a concert, every time we do anything that has Grace Church connected, the gospel will be shared, either spoken or in written form. That is the commitment of this ministry. <clears throat> and that's supposed to be the commitment of every believer. You know, the world doesn't receive the gospel as anything but foolishness until they're transformed by it. Look at this in 1 Corinthians 1. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Don't get confused. He's not saying God's foolish. He's not saying he's weak. He's saying if God on his worst day, gave the worst message, it'd be better than anything we could produce. In other words, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power to salvation. Now, understand this. There are components to the gospel that must be spoken for it to be the gospel. A lot of people think when we say the gospel of Jesus, we're talking about four of the books in the New Testament. We're not. The gospel is literally these words, Christ died for our sins. We'll see this in 1 Corinthians 15. So, here are the components that are necessary to share the plan of salvation. One, God created all of us. We're not an accident. We are a masterpiece. And the first man and first woman, they sinned and they blew it for all of us. We are infected with a disease called sin and we will die from this disease. And if we don't know Jesus, we'll spend eternity in hell. Because God is not just a loving God, he's a holy God. <clears throat> now, 
we can go to church and be good and promise to be good and be kind and have no conflict in our life, that doesn't save you. Too many people think that getting to heaven is like those huge scales in the hands of justice. And when we get to heaven, God's going to take all Rick's good deeds and he's going to put them on one side, tink, and then he's going to take all the bad things he's ever done, back up the truck, and whichever weighs the most is going to determine where I go. That's a lie of religion. And you know what? Satan loves that message. Because it is a message. It doesn't just confuse people around the world. It is a message that appeals to Americans. Because I don't, whoa, oh, you you mean God did it all? I don't get to participate? Oh, no, no, no. No, that can't be. The gospel then culminates with this reality. God saw us in our sin. He sent his only son, Jesus, into the world. God in the flesh, lived a perfect life, died 33 and a half years after he was born in the world, paid for all of our sins by washing them away in his blood, rose again three days later and said, believe in me and I'll give to you everlasting life. Trust in me and you'll be saved. It's nothing we do, it's all of what he did on the cross. Guys, Christianity is not about what you do. Christianity is about what's been done for you and what will be done through you. <clears throat> Second, embrace humility as a strength and a way of life. If you're going to get along with people, if you're going to go through life being able to resolve conflict and starting in your marriage and in your family, you better embrace humility. Why is it that every message, it seems like in every church and every chapter of the Bible comes back to humility? Because it is both the most important character trait we can take on, and the most difficult. We're not talking about humiliation. We're talking about humility. There's a big difference. Humiliation is feeling terrible about yourself. Humility is about feeling confident in who you are. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. That's the problem with most of us. When we're having problems, what are we doing? We're thinking all about ourselves. Oh, I was ter- oh, my life's horrible. Nobody loves me. I got no friends. I'm really miserable. Oh, I, 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 I. Get your eyes off of you. Put them on Christ. Humble yourself before God. Look at this. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish. I circled that and wrote my name there. God considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. That is like my life verse or verses. Because I have found myself in many situations, not just this church, where I'm thinking, I have no business being here with all these really smart, Beautiful, amazing people. I feel that way every weekend with you. And yet God says, hey, you trust me, you humble yourself before me, and I'll use you. And you know what brings peace into our lives with people around us? When we see them the same way. I've been reading a book. My wife uh, wanted me to read. I I read it uh, a couple of chapters a few years ago called The Road Back to You, and uh, it's a study of the Enneagram, an ancient uh, uh, kind of character study and personality, and it's, it's phenomenal. It really is amazing, and, and uh, I've just been face-to-face with my weaknesses. It's hard to face those. I've been able to look and say, okay, well, I've improved in some areas, but I've got a long ways to go. But what it's really helped me do is embrace how much God loves me and how he says, I'm never done with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Don't worry about that. And it's also helped me to understand other people in my life. Guys, it is critical that we realize life is short. I talked to a guy the other day who said he hasn't spoken to his son in 14 years. And I said, why? And he told me about the fight they had. And I literally waited until he was done and said, listen, I don't want to belittle your pain, but go talk to your son. That's foolish. 
you could be dead tomorrow. Just go do it. This past week, and this isn't really what I handle most of the time, Pastor Scott does, Pastor Barry, but I, I was in three emergency counseling situations with couples in this church that have been cornerstone couples whose marriages are ending right now. Guys, if you're standing on the cusp of that, don't make any decisions. Stay with me through this series. There's much to be said about not only personal conflict, but marital conflict. And finally, he says, if we're going to get along, we got to thank God for who he is and all he has done. we got to have an attitude of gratitude. Now, before I close, I want you to pack up because I need to share something really important for all of us here at Grace. 1 Corinthians 1, the end of the chapter, Paul writes, As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. This ministry is all about what God has done. And every changed life is about what God has done. It's just God honoring our faithfulness. That's it. Every penny given through this ministry, every miracle that God brings through this ministry, it's all about him. I had a conversation with my youngest son who's in California and right in the middle of those earthquakes, but right before the earthquakes, literally hours before, my son calls me. He's like, Dad, I just finished reading the book of Revelation again. Man, it's awesome. That's not normally the response of people who read the book of Revelation, I just want to tell you. And I'm like, really? I got to hear this. So he's just telling me what he got out of it and what he gleaned. And he said, man, Dad, you can just see from natural disasters, true story, to you know the, the, the depravity of man that, that Jesus' return is getting closer. I said, yeah, it is. And I read Revelation 4.11. I said, son, this is what it's all about, giving God the glory. You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and they exist for your purpose, because you created them, and you are pleased with what you created. And I said, uh, son, that time, uh, tribulation in the future, the return of Christ, I said, that's still ahead of us. But I go, as much as we want to be with Jesus, as much as we want to experience heaven, we have a job to do right now. There are many people that still need Jesus. He said, you're right, Dad. Four hours later, he's in a 6.9 earthquake. He said it almost threw him out of bed. He's like, wow, that was something after reading the book of Revelation. I go, yeah, I bet it was. <laughs> we talked about it a little bit more, but here's, here's what you need to understand. God can shake you up literally. Send an earthquake. He can shake us up through a little breeze and a still small voice. He can shake us up by saying, okay, if you think you can do it yourself, go ahead. And life can become a catastrophe. I would prefer that God gets my attention through his word, through the examples he set for us. The church of Corinth, I'm just going to jump ahead to the end of the story. We got a long ways to go. The church of Corinth heard Paul they were transformed. Matter of fact, the book of 2 Corinthians is one of the greatest celebrations of transformation. The hope that Paul presents along with the challenges in Corinthians is realized in 2 Corinthians. And I believe that hope is in store for us in this ministry. You know, we don't pass an offering plate, so if you're a guest, we're not going to, so just relax. Right now, we have thousands of viewers online, and most of us in this ministry carry the responsibility of, of giving through the ministry because we reach so many lost people that about 40% of us don't give at all. And I'm saying this because I want you to hear what God just did. So over the course of the last year and a half, it's been very difficult personally because we've been in a tight place as a ministry. And part of the reason was when we built this building, we built it on the commitments of people, and a lot of people aren't here. You know, they got upset about things. That happens. And so we were in this loan with the bank, and I won't name the bank. 
And uh, we had a first and a second with them because they forced us to split the loan into two. And we had a pretty good interest rate. Things were going okay. And then over the course of the last year, I said, listen, we've got almost $5 million in equity. And we have things falling apart. When thousands of people come through here for nine straight years, we got a lot of work to do, right? And I said, on top of that, we have a lot of vision for our youth, for our children, for our adults. We have a sound system that really is, I made comments about the volume, it's, it's $180,000 from even being complete. That's why it's hard to even manage a full band through our system. And so I said, you know, can we just get $500,000 equity line and as we use it, we'll pay on it? No. So I, I gave him my vision and with a bunch of people in my office, the president got up and walked out. And I said, so am I going to hear from you? This was on a Thursday back in March. He said, yeah, you know, Monday or Tuesday, I'll let you know. Never call back. Never return my calls. Now, all of our banking is done through this bank. All of 42 credit cards, because all of our ministries operate on credit cards. Listen to me. We are audited every week by an outside entity. Our finances are pristine. We have never missed a payment, never been late, ever in this ministry. Okay. Never heard from him. So I said, that's it. Talked to my friend Wes. We got another banker involved. A Christian owned and operated bank. Huge global bank. 55 billion liquid in assets. And they came in, heard the vision and said, we absolutely want to work with you. So over the course of the last few months, while I've been traveling, been dealing with all of this, on Wednesday, they sent paperwork over to our old bank and said, we're closing. Uh, we're buying the loans. And we're, we're closing with uh, Pastor Rick 12.30 today. Within five minutes, the banker called. Interesting how that happens. Kind of hassled Karen. What, you guys are leaving? I mean, that's it? We're done? That's all? <clears throat> she said, hey, I'm not the boss, but you guys really didn't jump at helping us. So he still never called me. But what he did do is five minutes after that, he cut off all of our credit cards. Literally stopped we, we were done doing business on Wednesday, and we're done doing business right now until we get our new credit cards. That's how we function. It was really rotten. You know, part of my salary is actually on my credit card because of pastoral expenses. Gone. We're leaving today. Gone. So it was just very frustrating. Well, on top of that, the other bank comes in and says, we can't close now. And they got a, a uh, buyout. Our prepayment penalty was supposed to be $29,000. It was 158000 I was just like, this, this can't be happening. So I went to close. I was just like, God, please show me what to do. And he made it clear that, number one, over the course of the next 13 months, our mortgage payment is $15,000 less a month with this new bank. At the end of the 13 months, when it jumps up to full PITI, it's $3,200 a month less. On top of that, we have a line of equity so that when emergencies happen or some of the vision work that needs to be done around here is done, we're not struggling to make payroll the next month. It's just a wise way to live. And so God worked a miracle. I, I'll be honest, it didn't go the way I'd hoped it would, but God has reasons. But while I'm sitting there, the title company, Kevin, is sitting next to me. I just met this guy. And he goes, can you just tell me a little bit about your church? I'm like, you bet. So I just start rolling. And about 10 minutes in, his eyes are huge. And I'm thinking, man, I wonder what this guy thinks. And he goes, you're the most inspirational person I've ever met. Where's your church at? And so we have this great talk. And I write down all the information. I hope he's coming in the next service. But it was so encouraging to hear somebody knows nothing about grace go, wow, I want to be a part of that. Guys, that's the kind of church we want to be, a church that trusts God that deals with conflict and honors him. Let me have you bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute. Before we close in song, if you're here and you, before you heard me a few minutes ago explain the gospel, could not honestly say you know for sure you're going to heaven when you die, I want to challenge you to receive the free gift. You can talk to God in your mind and say, God, I'm a sinner. I've done things wrong. But today, I believe Jesus Christ died for me, and I received the free gift of salvation. Friend, if you put your trust in Christ, welcome to the family of God. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to have you stand up or come forward. In a moment, with heads bowed and eyes closed, I'll have you raise your hand and put it right back down. It lets me know you got it. So if you're saying today, 
July 7, 2019, I received Jesus' free gift of salvation. Would you just slip your hand up and put it right back down? Bless you guys. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Praise God. I promised I wouldn't embarrass you, so I'll ask you to do me a favor and text the word believe to 313131, and I'll give you a call. Just text the word believe, 313131. We'll welcome you to the family of God, see if we can answer any questions. And if you're a guest, same thing. Just type the word guest, 313131. We'll give you a call. Father, thank you for these you've called into your kingdom. Thank you for this book that is an example to all of us of how to get it together. And I pray that we will in Jesus' name. Amen. Before someone leads us in this song, um, our biggest fundraiser for our 32 churches in the jungle is our golf tournament. You don't have to be a golfer to do it. We have putt-putt the same day. We're having a huge deal this year. It's a big bash uh, auction. It's incredible. Sign up is out there today. Sign up for foursome. Get involved. Go to the putt-putt. All the proceeds go to our work in the Amazon. And please pray for Doug and Blanca Usher, our missionaries in the jungle. She got a bad report medically, and so we're dealing with that right now. I'm praying for them and just praying for God to, to heal her and work through the doctors. I'll let you know more as we move forward. So let's worship. Let's worship.